Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Vinod? Please stay tuned. Uh, we are expecting Professor Vinod to uh, start the program. Please stay tuned, everyone. Yes, Vinod, where are you? <coughs> the program will commence shortly. Please stay tuned. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So now, now we are connected. Sorry. Sorry for the, this internet glitch. So yeah, uh, we can start now. Uh, so uh, a very good morning to all the dignitaries and participants of this virtual event. On behalf of Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda, I extend a hearty and warm welcome to an eminent scientist and speaker of the day, Professor Krishan and Ganesh, Director Aisar Tirupati. I welcome you, sir. Thank the you. Central University of Punjab, Bhatinda, is organizing uh, uh, various activities as a part. Yeah. As a part of the Foundation Week celebration from 21st February to 28th February. 2022 under the guidance of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raghavendra Prasad Tiwari ji. On this occasion, in the special lecture series, it is indeed privileged to hear our Honorable Speaker, Professor Ganesh, who would be delivering his talk on a very important topic, spine surgery of peptide nucleic acids, upgrading PNAs for multi-stranded assemblies. So uh, as a protocol, we start the event with the university song. So I request you all to kindly rise for the university song. Now I request Professor Vinod Kumar, head of the chemistry department, to give a brief introduction about the department and to formally introduce our honorable speaker. Oh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rakesh. 
So uh, the Central University of Punjab, it was established in uh, 2009 and uh, the Department of Ministry started in 2015. And uh, during the uh, spot, uh, uh, short span of time, so university is ranked 84th in NIRF and it's the only university in top 100 among us the newly established uh, central universities. So the department is running two master programs and uh, one PhD program with eight faculty members and faculty of the department have received various extramural research grants amounting to rupees more than 700 lakh. Uh, since last six years, the faculty members have published about 120 research articles in well-reputed international journals with the average impact factor of around 4.21. And uh, I'm happy to share with you, sir, that last year we have got a DST feast grant of uh, rupees 115 lakh. Uh, currently, Professor Raghavendra Prasad Tiwari is the current vice chancellor of the Central University. Uh, he believes in simple living and high thinking and under his guidance, dynamic guidance, the university is uh, setting uh, new milestones. Uh, about the eminent speak, uh, speaker, so uh, we're really uh, feeling lucky to have uh, Professor Krishna and Ganesh today uh, among us. So Professor Ganesh uh, is currently working as a, a founder director of Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, uh, Tirupati. Uh, he's the, uh, it is his second tenure as a uh, founder director and before it, uh, he served as a founder director of ICER Pune uh, in 2006. Uh, he has done uh, two PhDs, one from Delhi University uh, in 1976 and uh, other uh, through Commonwealth Fellowships from Cambridge University in 1980. Uh, the CV is really uh, quite illustrious. I'm uh, uh, taking up the uh, brief uh, things about, uh, from, the, from the CV. So proper, uh, Professor Ganesh's research interests, it includes chemistry and biology of uh, nucleic acids, focusing on therapeutic and diagnostic applications of DNA analogous, structural biology of uh, uh, collagens, peptides, and the emerging area of uh, DNA nanotechnology. So he has published more than 170 publications in reputed international journals, two international patents, and guided more than 45 PhD students. Uh, Professor Ganesh is a fellow of all the three Indian science academies. He's also a fellow of uh, TWAS. He served as a president of Division of Organic and Biomolecular Chemistry of IUPAC uh, in the year 2012-13. Professor Ganesh has received innumerable professional awards and the most prominent ones, Santi Swarup Bhatnagar Award uh, in Chemical Sciences. He also got TWAS uh, prize for Chemical Sciences, Sastra Siena Rao Award of uh, Sastra University, HK uh, Florida Bigyan Bhushan Award, and National Researcher Award in, uh, nanotechnology, in Nanoscience and uh, Technology. Uh, he has served as a member of uh, various policy making and project advisory committees of Department of Science and Technology and Department of Biotechnology. He's currently a member of uh, Nano Science Advisory Group of DST and Nano Science Missions. So, Professor Ganesh served as member of various editorial advisory boards uh, in highly reputed journals, including Chemistry and Asian Journal, Journal of Organic Chemistry, uh, Bilstein Journal of Organic Chemistry, and Oligonucleotides. Uh, he's also founding editor of uh, ACS Omega. Uh, Professor Ganesh. He provided great leadership, not only in research and development, but in institution building uh, to establish ICERs as brand science education and research institutes. These are now attaining international recognitions. Uh, we are really lucky to have you, sir, here uh, today in our campus, uh, not physically, but virtually. And uh, I kindly request you to uh, deliver your talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Vinod Kumar, for your kind words of introduction. And also, I must thank the symposium organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And being the you know, founding member of two of the ICERs right from the day one, I do realize what are the steps which uh, Central University of Punjab has gone through since 2009 to come to today's situation. And I was very pleased to hear that your 
in the top NARF ranking and also actively publishing research papers. Uh, although I do not have not uh, visited or maybe sometime in the future I will get an opportunity to visit, but I do realize what it takes for a new university uh, to build up all the campus, provide research laboratories, recruit students, recruit faculty, and it's a tall order. For the first 15, 20 years, is a tall order when you also have to establish yourself in the academic world. Uh, with these uh, brief remarks, let me share my uh, screen to start my talk. Yes, see, I seem to have some problem. Can you see the screen? Can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. It okay. is uh, you. Uh, please make it uh, full screen. I'll, I yeah, can yeah, make, make it. Yeah. Screen. But you see the presentation, right? Yes, sir. Now it's okay. fine. Perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. So today I am going to speak to you on uh, some of the work which we have been doing for a long time, uh, almost for about 20, 25 years. Um, this is my one of my main areas and it is titled as spine surgery of peptide nucleic acids. Perhaps uh, may, people may think it is a medical uh, lecture, but you see a picture also of the spine, but I will relate it to its relevance to my work uh, sometimes, you know, in the, uh, during the course of my talk. So we have been working on this uh, area called peptide nucleic acids. Now, let me start with a very, very brief introduction to nucleic acids. It's a, I'm sure the students know about it, uh, but just to give enough background for my work, all of you know about nucleic acids DNA, which is perhaps the most, most important chemical in life because it not only codes for all the functions of cells through the proteins, it also regulates, it also transfers information across uh, generations. Now, it's a simple chemical. It has got, the structure is a sugar, a ribose sugar, deoxyribose sugar in RNA, in, in DNA. Uh, the ribose is linked to the phosphate, so it has a backbone. Uh, you can use the term spine and backbone interchangeably. So it has a backbone with alternating sugar and phosphate. It also has the nucleobases, mainly four of them, heterocyclic bases, A, C, G, and T. They're linked at the glycosidic position to the sugar. Uh, it is a, it's a chiral molecule. And the most important thing about DNA is not only its backbone structure with repeating units of sugar and phosphate, but also the attachment of bases, four nucleobases, uh, which are called as guanine and cytidine, which are related by complementarity. If you have G, it can hydrogen bond with complementary C. Similarly, A can hydrogen bond with T with two hydrogen bonds. This is perhaps the most important, you know, complementarity that occurs in nature, because this is what which allows DNA to transfer information during cell division. So as a result of this covalent structure of sugar, phosphate, and also the two strands, the complementarity of the strands, DNA assumes the formation of double helix, that is the structure, which is shown on the right-hand side picture. So the two strands are held together by complementary hydrogen bonding. So the information in one strand is automatically uh, transferred to the information in the other strand because of the complementary nature. Given this structure, covalent structure of nucleic acids in the duplex, it has no alternative but to assume a three-dimensional structure in which the two strands are held together in a double helical form. And the topology of the double helix, you can clearly see that it has got grooves in between. Um, one is called as a major groove, which is very wide. The other is called as a minor groove, which is narrow. That is important because through those grooves, the DNA recognizes other molecules such as proteins, the major groove, small molecule drugs in the minor groove, etc. I will not go too much into details about the DNA itself, except to say that it not only it forms a Watson you know, duplex, which is called as a watson trick duplex, uh, located by these you know, hydrogen bonds, it also forms a triple helix, 
you know, when you have this adenine, which can hydrogen bond to thymine on one side, through what's called the WC Watson-Crick hydrogen bonding, it can also bind in another thymine in the Hoogstein side, so it can also form a triplex DNA. So not only DNA can form double X, uh, duplex, it can also form triplex DNA. Now, this is how the triplex DNA derived from C sequences. So for these triplexes to form, you notice that the central strand has to be adenine, adenine, oh, yeah. not the adenine. Because adenine, you see the st chemical structure of adenine, it can form hydrogen bonding from both the sides. A pyrimidine like thymine cannot form such hydrogen bonding, pyrimidine or cytidine. Only adenine and guanine being purines, they can form hydrogen bonding from both sides. So for triplex formation, you require what we call is a poly stretch, you know, polyadenine stretch or a polyguanine stretch. So DNA can form a duplex, it can form a triplex. Not only that, DNA can also form a tetraplex structure. This is all the magic of hydrogen bonding complementarity. Now in the tetraplex structure, which is called as guanine four tetraplex. Here you can see that the four guanines, they can form hydrogen bond amongst themselves, like a self-based pairing through kind of a Hoogstein pairing. And because of that, a strand can wind around. There are several different forms of tetraplex structures and they're very, very important during cell division and for the cancer activity of some enzymes, et cetera, it is very, very important, tetraplex. So it is a very hot target for uh, uh, drug design. Now, if Gs can form a tetraplex on the opposite strand, cytidines will be there. They can also form a tetraplex but their tetraplex structure is different from the vein with the guanine form. You will see some of these structures later on uh, when I explain the peptide nucleic acid. The important thing about C tetraplex is that two cytidines can hydrogen bond you know, in a complementary way, but that requires a proton here. You know? So only at acidic pH, when the nitrogen of cytidine gets protonated, it can form hydrogen bonding. So in the tetraplex structure, what is shown in the cartoon diagram, you have two cytidines held by, by, by two strands and another two cytidines held by another two strands. And these strands are what is called the intercalated. You know, they do not form a tetraplex like guanine, all cyclic structure, but they form two cytidines dimers, which are inter interdigitated or intercalated into each other to form tetraplex structure. So all you have to remember is that DNA forms duplex, it forms triplex, and it forms tetraplex, which are of two kinds, guanine and cytidine. Now, why all this is important? Now, now DNA is emerging, already it has emerged in the last 25 years as a drug molecule. Nobody would believe if I say that DNA is a drug molecule because we know that the DNA, a double helical structure, it first gets translated to the messenger RNA and this messenger RNA codes all the information which is required for the protein, protein folding. So when defective proteins are formed, the cells, you know, they become diseased. Many diseases are caused by defective proteins. Now you have to stop those proteins from functioning. The way in which the medicinal chemists do is that they design a drug molecule, which can go and bind to those protein molecules. Sometimes some proteins are overexpressed also. So you need to stop the overactivity of defective proteins and also the normal proteins. So these drug molecules, which are designed by medicinal chemists, which are small molecules, they go and bind to a cavity within the protein. And as most of you know, drug design to a protein is a tall order. You know, you know the three dimensional structure, you go through a lot of computer calculations, et cetera, to design a drug molecule, but still it's a very, very difficult process because we don't understand how the protein is organized in a three dimensional manner. On the other hand, if you look at messenger RNA, now instead of allowing the messenger RNA to make a protein, what you can do is you can short, you can add a short stretch of oligonucleotide, which is known as ODN, which is shown in the magenta strand here. If it is complementary to the RNA sequence, it goes and binds to this duplex and it forms what is called as a hybrid, RNA-DNA hybrid. Green is RNA, red one is DNA, you know, the oligonucleotide. The moment it is formed, the enzymes which, you know, read the messenger RNA to make the proteins, they cannot read it. So this antisense oligonucleotide is a drug molecule which blocks the function of messenger RNA and no proteins are synthesized. So you can stop the production of defective proteins. So now here in this sense, instead of a drug binding to a protein, this drug is binding to DNA itself. 
So this is called as antisense oligonucleotide. It is much easier. All you have to know is the structure sequence of messenger RNA, which is relevant to the disease, which is now available with all the human genome sequencing. So it is very easy to design this kind of you know, molecule, antisense oligonucleotides. There are other mechanisms by which oligonucleotides can also act. For example, molecules which are called as ribozymes. You know, they're very complex molecules, have these kind of hairpin structures. They can also go and bind to messenger RNA. But what they do is not only they bind to messenger RNA, they destroy the messenger RNA. In the previous case, they're only sterically blocking the antisense. But here, ribozyme, they go and cut the, you know, this assumes enzyme activity and they destroy the messenger RNA so that it is not available. This also can be achieved by an enzyme called ribonuclease H. So either you block the function of messenger RNA sterically or you degrade them by using ribozyme or ribonuclease H. So in this case, this ribonuclease, you know, this red strand, magenta strand is also a drug molecule. And there is a third concept, which is called as short interfering RNA or siRNA, which was actually the invention of that gave the Nobel prize to people about 15, 20 years back. In this case, what happens is that you can put a short stretch of RNA molecules, which do essentially the same thing, but it does in collaboration with an enzyme called you know, risk system. So the siRNA, microRNA can also be blocked and this risk system goes and destroys the messenger RNA. So the idea of using DNA or RNA as a drug is to prevent the action of messenger RNA either by sterically blocking or even destroying the messenger RNA. And now already more than about five to six drugs have been approved and uh, uh, based on these principles. So the mechanism does work. Now there is also another mechanism called antisense triplex. I will not talk about that here. A DNA can form a triple helix. I told you about the triplex. So the moment it forms a triplex, it can inhibit the function of DNA replication. So what I've tried to show you in this slide as an introduction is that antisense, ribozyme, DNAzyme, siRNA, microRNA, and the so-called the latest one, CRISPR-Cas, all these systems, they target the defective genes and they block, and that's the reason they can function as uh, you know, drug molecules. So the idea is that a short stretch of DNA or RNA itself is a drug. Now we are looking at a drug molecule, not as a genetic material, which most biologists look at. Now, if it becomes a drug molecule, we know that the drugs should have certain properties. They should have favorable pharmacokinetic properties, pharmacodynamic properties, stability, et cetera. So if you think DNA is a drug molecule, then you have to impart all these activities. Because we know if you put DNA inside the molecule or RNA, there are nucleases which go and chop them off. So they cannot reach the target molecule. So you have to make them resistant to nucleases. Then you have to make DNA RNA hybrid stable here for ribonuclease H to act. You know, this should be a stable you know, structure. And most important thing is that DNA or RNA should go inside the cells. That is a very, very important thing. But you know that for going inside the cells, you require membranes. Membranes are negative in character. They have lipid molecules. DNA also is negative because it has a phosphate groups. As a result, DNA cannot go inside the cells. They cannot go through the membrane because of the membrane surface, there's a charge charge repulsion. So you have to do something to make them cell permeability and also pharmacodynamics. Now, all these attributes require that you have to modify the DNA structure. The natural DNA molecule cannot act. So you have to modify the structure. And if you look at the DNA molecule, I have just shown a part structure from an organic chemist point of view is a wonderful molecule because you can modify it so many places. First of all, you can modify the phosphate group because enzymes go and cut the phosphate. So if you modify the phosphate, they become stable to the enzymes. So sugar phosphate modification, you can do that. Or you have this so-called two prime one on the ring. You can attach some substitutions so that that also helps in making the enzyme more stable to nucleases. You can modify the sugar. You know, the oxygen can be replaced by nitrogen, sulfur, and carbon, etc. So a number of different kinds of modifications are possible in case of DNA uh, purely for the medicinal purposes. The simplest modification which was done was simply to replace the oxygen by sulfur. This is called as phosphorothioate. The moment you replace sulfur, you know, the, this phosphate becomes resistant to nucleases. Nucleases require a phosphodiester bond. The moment sulfur is there, 
nucleases cannot cut it, so it becomes stable to nucleases. Instead of sulfur, you can also attach a methyl group, for example, because you still have a negative charge. By putting a methyl group, you can remove the charge so that it can go inside. But the problem with these two approaches is that the phosphorus becomes chiral. Initially, phosphorus is not chiral. This becomes chiral. So you have to have a R, S configuration, and you have to make stereochemical compounds to make into a drug molecule. Alternatively, you can introduce some substitutions into the sugar. For example, OCH3 group at the two prime position here, or ethoxy methyl group here, or the two fluoro group. All these substitutions, they prevent that they, one is they change the conformation of the sugar, they make it more favorable for binding. And the second thing is they also stabilize the nucleases. So this is called the second generation antisense oligonucleotide. The first generation, the phosphate backbone, second generation involved sugar modification. In the third generation, what they did was, you know, if the DNA is a polymer, if it has to bind to RNA, their conformations are different. So you have to conformationally, you can tune the DNA so that it binds it much better. Entropically, it should be favored. So for that, you can do by bridging the four position with the two prime, four prime and two prime. This is called as lock nucleic acids. By doing this thing, you get the sugar into a right conformation pucker so that it binds the RNA. So these are called as lock nucleic acids. And another modification, which has recently proved very, very valuable for developing a drug against Duquesne muscular dystrophy is the so-called morpholino oligonucleotides. So you can change the sugar into morpholino derivatives. And, but the, and another one, which, which is my interest is so-called peptide nucleic acids. Here, as you see, this is the simplest of all these modifications. You have a simple ethylene diamine to which a glycine is attached. And there is no chirality in this molecule. There is only a tertiary amide group, very simple molecule, no chirality. And this was 1991, this was designed. It's not a naturally occurring molecule because of its simplicity, non chirality et cetera. You know, we thought that we should focus on these peptide nucleic acids to develop them as third generation antisense oligonucleotides. Now, as I said, if you look at the DNA and peptide nucleic acid, you know, it is called a peptide, but it is a polyamide. You know, peptides are dipep, you know, two alpha amino acids linked together. But now what you have is glycine here, only one alpha amino acid, it is linked to ethylene diamine. So it is not truly a peptide. It is really not a nucleic acid because there is no acid group. But what is important is that the structure of DNA and the structure of PNA, if you compare, the distance between the two bases in DNA exactly matches geometrically the two base distance in PNA. And this is what is important to form a, you know, nucleic acid complementarity. So this molecule is an amino ethyl methylene carbonyl. And so we thought of working on this molecule immediately after it was reported. The beauty of this molecule is that, you know, this is like a peptide, you know, it's not like a DNA. DNA has a sugar three prime hydroxyl and a five prime hydroxyl. So you call it five prime, three prime. Those who work on DNA, you know, that gives a directionality into the DNA. But if you are a, if you are a peptide, you have to call it as N-terminus and carboxy terminus. So peptide nucleic acids, they can bind the complementary DNA. If you make a PNA molecule with CAGT, it can exactly bind to the DNA. It binds so beautifully that it binds better than the DNA. You know, if you have another DNA, if binding to the recognition, this PNA binds it even more efficiently. So PNA is a beautiful molecule, a very simple molecule, a polyamide, no charges, so it should get into the cells much easily, and it binds DNA. Uh, can somebody mute your microphone? And Excuse me? Can someone mute your microphone? Hello. Can you ask people to mute their microphone, please? Dr. Dr. Felix, please mute others. You know, I cannot speak if I get this background. Thank you. So this peptide nucleic acid can bind to the DNA. So when it binds, it can form a duplex, as is shown in the cartoon diagram, N-terminus, carboxy terminus, etc. So we can get instead of a DNA, RNA duplex. So if you have a gene, DNA, by putting a complementary PNA, you can make it an antisense oligonucleotide. 
So it can form a duplex, it can bind to DNA or it can bind to RNA and don't worry about this parallel antiparallel. And also it can form a triple helix. You know, if you have two PNA molecules with a polyadenine, it can form a PNA to DNA triple helix. So PNA can become an ideal, what you call as a decoy, because it is stable. It is not a, it is stable to proteases because it is not a protein, it is a polyamide. It is stable to nu nucleases because it is not like nucleic acid. So one is PNA binds to DNA in a sequence specific manner. And the duplex stability is very high compared to the DNA stability. It is stable to both proteases and nucleases. So these are all the ideal requisites to make PNA an antisense molecule. And the, but the negative aspect is that it does not go into cells easily because there are no charges. And uh, you know, uh, although there are no negative charges, the PNA is highly hydrophobic. It gets stuck in the membrane. So what one has to do is that just like we improve the properties of DNA, you know, first generation, second generation, third generation, one can look at the various kinds of modifications you can do on the PNA. You know, for an organic chemist, this appears to be very, you know, uninteresting, you know, it is just as a hydrocarbon backbone, etc. But if you really see from a medicinal chemistry perspective, the way in which you can modify peptide nucleic acid, it is amazing. You know, we have spent 25 years, I will show you later on the kind of modifications you can affect on this very, very simple backbone. Now, for example, here you have ethylene diamine, you can add an extra carbon atom to make propylene, or you can add another extra bond onto the glycine side here, as is shown in the other one, you know, the red oval shows the modifications, or you can add an extra bond onto the side chain here, or you can remove the carbonyl group here, you know, make the amide into an amine so that it becomes cationic, you know, once it becomes positive charge, it can go inside the cells better, or you can introduce substitutions onto the backbone as R1 and R2. By doing this, you can also make it chiral molecule, or you can add an amine group, you know, to make it cationic, or you can add guanidinium. And so a number of these initial modifications were done as soon as, you know, it was invented, it was actually done by Nielsen, you know, he's the one who did that. I think there's a spelling mistake, it should be S-E-N, Nielsen, he did that. And we also got into the game and we had done some modifications like cationic ones to make them go inside the cells better. This is where the so-called spinal surgery comes. Now let us look at the achiral PNA. You know, it is a whole backbone. I have written in an elongated backbone and it has got, you know, this basis. You know, the spine consists of discs also, right? We can look at these bases as the discs in the spine. Now, what we had done is, what we did was, instead of having this big spine, elongated spine, to make it chemically modified, we tried several strategies. For example, you can you know, link up two of these atoms to get this pyrrolinyl one. Now this, you're bringing a conformational constraint on the backbone, so the conformation changes. This you can do in several ways. You can attach the glycine to the ethylene diamine side, or you can attach the carbon atom from the base to the backbone side, or you can attach from the base to the glycine side. So each of these modifications will give you ring structures, constraint structures, and also they become chiral. So each of them, you will have, you know, two chiral centers. You can actually make, you know, all the four dasteriomers possible. And what I've shown here, it is not in one molecule. You can make PNA with all pyrrolidyl this modification or with this modification or with this modification. You know, all of them will give entirely different classes of PNA. So you're actually doing surgery on the spine to change the shape of the spine for more stability and better properties. On the other hand, instead of the five-membered ring, you can also make into a six-membered ring. You can add an extra carbon atom. This can be derived from pipecolic acid. If you see this pyrrolidyl line, all of them have proline kind of structure. You see this nitrogen and carbonyl. So if you take substituted proline, you can prepare all these kinds of modifications. You know, you can make this pipecolic acid uh, or you can also make a, another modification. You can put a cyclohexane ring. You can only constrain on one bond here. And one bond, you put a cyclohexane ring. So again, you get two stereocenters. They can be diaxial, axial equatorial, or diequatorial. They all give rise to different kinds of conformations of PNA. And so the five-membered ring, you can also make it a cyclopentyl ring. So for almost 10 years, from 1995 to 2005, we worked on these conformationally constrained chiral PNAs in fact, each of these modification is two PhD thesis work. And I must say that because you have to make several 
chiral um, you know, molecules, you have to synthesize them, develop synthesis strategy, and then test them for biophysical and biochemical properties. So almost for 10 years, we worked on these kinds of modifications. But, but we could not generalize you know, very many things. Some of them were good, some of them were not so good. Then we decided to work on, you know, and also they're very, very you know, difficult you to resolution, et cetera, involved. Then we thought that let us look into a very simple system. We know that it can also conformationally constrain by putting sterically bulky groups. So we thought that let us put jump dimethyl group on this carbon atom. You know, it becomes a spiral kind of structure and becomes conformationally constrained. At the same time, there is no chirality here. As you see this, so we thought this is a very smart move to put conformationally constrained. Either you can put at this methylene, you know, if you go to PNA, you can put at this methylene or the ethylene diamine side. So we call it as the alpha jump dimethyl group, or you can put gamma, or you can put beta. So we started making jump dimethyl PNAs and they gave, you know, fantastically very, very excellent results. Very recently, we have also have made what is called the Aza PNA. Instead of jump dimethyl steric bulk, we thought that we can attach a NH and this can form hydrogen bonding. So, you know, this also becomes like a urea linkage. So we can constrain, conformationally constrain through hydrogen bonding. And the other thing we did was to also to put fluoro. This only shows you, you know, different kind of modifications. I do not want to give you an impression that in the same molecule, all of them are there. Each modification is a different PNA set. And you now here, for example, we put fluorine molecules. You know, by putting fluorine, we can take the molecules inside the cells better. In fact, about 25 to 30% of the drugs have fluorines in them because they improve the cell permeability. So we prepared fluoro PNA, which actually went inside the cells, you know, uh, very nicely. Then we also made other kind of PNA molecules, which are called as cationic chiral. So we have conformationally constrained chiral molecules. We have acyclic one, no rings, achiral molecules, and then acyclic molecules, but which are chiral and which are also cationic. The moment you put NH2 groups, guanidinium, they become positively charged so they can go inside the cells better. So this is the spinal surgery that we have been doing, you know, improving, optin, you know, uh, um, uh, changing the you know, backbone of peptide nucleic acids. And this has been a tremendous work. You know, as I said, in about uh, from 1995 to 2005, about, you know, we made all these modifications. It's about 10 PhD thesis work, you know, what I've shown here, each one of them is a modification. We investigated, developed the chiral synthesis, but none of them actually proved very good, except for this so-called, you know, cyclohexanyl and cyclopentyl, one which are shown on the top, you know, they showed some very good activity, but the synthesis was so complicated that we didn't want to pursue with that. Then in the last, you know, after 2005, we have been concentrating on these, you know, fluoro PNAs, alpha jump dimethyl PNA, gamma jump dimethyl, beta jump dimethyl, some of these things showed very, very high selectivity. Fluoro PNA went inside the cells better. And of late, very recently, last year, we made another kind of modification in which a gamma PNA, we attach what is called the N-acetyl galactosamine, GALNAC. Now this can bind to receptors and this goes specifically to hepatocyte cells. So we are now getting into the regime using all of our modification knowledge to uh, develop, uh, to inhibit gene or the protein synthesis within the cells. Now, the main talk, you know, my thing is coming now. Uh, now, in all these, you know, in the previous kinds of peptide nucleic acid molecule, you see that, you know, all these molecules can bind uh, nucleic acids from only one side. You know, you have got bases only one side of PNA. At this point, we thought that we should jump and can we make PNA molecules that can bind from both the sides, you know, one base on from one side, what is shown in the black is a conventional standard PNA. Can we modify instead of putting the chains, in addition to the chains, we thought that we can also conjugate nucleobases, A, G, C, and T. This can be done either through a click reaction or through an amide synthesis. Now here you see the blue molecule, it is at the glycine, you know, this glycine side, it has been linked in a stereospecific manner. We can make both the stereochemistries or at the gamma side, these are easier. You can start from lysine and build these things so you can attach the bases through an amide. So this we call as a bimodal PNA or a bifacial PNA. You know, the, the spine has been modified so that it's got two faces now. What this means is that, you know, if you have, if you take such a PNA molecule, synthesis is very tough. If you take that, 
and I can represent a cartoon diagram. You know, this is the PNA backbone and we have attached one through the tertiary amide linkage, the other through triazole or amide linkage. When you have a molecule like this PNA, it can bind to one DNA sequence from this side and it can bind to an another DNA sequence from this side. So same PNA can to perform two functions. If there are two genes, same PNA can go and suppress one gene from one side and another gene from another side. So this is also a duplex and this is also a duplex. So in these molecules, what we have done is we can fuse two duplexes, one helix here and another helix here on a common backbone or a spine. So this has been very, very interesting and it has sort of upgraded you know, DNA. It has a lot of wonderful properties, which I will tell you in the next half an hour or 20 minutes. Now, these kind of things can form a wide variety of molecules. Earlier, DNA or PNA can only form duplex, triplex, tetraplex. But now, each one of them can form a wide variety of structures. It can form PNA, DNA2, what we call as a double duplex. One duplex here, another duplex here. Or if two are PNA molecules, it can form PNA2, DNA triplex. It can form triple duplexes. Then it can form very complex tetraduplexes of tetra, you know, I will I'll show you. Uh, some of these in the next uh, thing. Now, let me start on this thing. Now, we want to make these kind of molecules, which I got basis on that side. Now, a little bit of chemistry. It is not a very straightforward thing. One has to make a number of these kinds of monomeric units which are required. And if you want to attach through click reaction, the easiest thing is to make a molecule like 10 here, which has got an azido group. And this is a monomer. And you can use solid phase peptide synthesis, start from a polymer, and you have A, G, C, or T, you can assemble in the direction you want, for example. So each one of them is a solid phase synthesis. You make, I think I'm sure all of you know about solid phase peptide synthesis. Then what you can do is that at every point when you've got azide here, then you can do a click reaction with G, you get G here. And then you create another azide here. If you want, you know, you leave it. In the third one, you click A. So if you want to make a mixed sequences by alternating peptide coupling and azido reaction, you can prepare a complex molecule like this. It has one sequence on this side and one sequence on this side. You know, it took a long time for us to standardize because it's an entirely new kind of chemistry. And so finally, we made these kinds of molecules, uh, which are called bimodal PNA. In fact, 80% of the work goes in the synthesis. After making these kinds of molecules, you know, as you see, is a complete about 15 or 20 more step synthesis and a linear synthesis. You cannot use block approach. Now, after making this molecule, you can purify by HPLC, and also you have to determine by characterization because these are chemical molecules. You have to characterize them. So this is just to show you that the molecules, you know, synthesis, we have rightly got the pure molecule and also the multi-top spectra and the characterization, the sequence is right, the structure is right, etc. So after making these molecules, so now I'm just giving you an example of two structures. In the top structure, you know, here I got the amide. As I said, this is chiral center, the blue chiral center. This is with the S configuration. You can also make the same thing with the R configuration. This is interesting to note that how the stereochemistry here changes their binding properties. So we made triazole conjugation, we made S, we made R, etc. So after making these ones, then again the R and the S, you know, this is again the solid phase peptide synthesis. As you see, you know, very complex. I will not go into that synthesis just to give you an idea that there's a lot of chemistry is involved uh, in this work. Okay, we have made the molecules. Now our next job is to look at how they bind to the DNA. Do they bind to DNA on both the sides or they bind to one DNA? Do they bind with different stability? Now we have to investigate that. How do we do that? This is done by very, very simple experiment. Now, if you take a DNA duplex, what is shown here, it is all linked to hydrogen bonding. What you do is that you put it in water and you heat it. When you heat it, the hydrogen bonding breaks. So in the duplex, these bases, they're all in a stacked conformation. They're all aromatic, they're nicely stacked. But when you heat it, the stacking goes away, they get liberated. So you will see a change in the UV spectra. If you plot the UV absorbance as a function of temperature, you get a curve like this. You know? So as the duplex breaks, you know, it is it's called the two-phase transition. So on the right-hand side, when everything becomes single strand, you know, and they're not bound to each other, the UV does not change. But in the middle point, the TM, you know, this, for example, 60 degree, at that point, the, it is breaking. So this tells about the stability of the duplex. All you have to remember from my talk today is that 
this Pm at the melting temperature indicates the stability of the duplex. The higher the value of Pm, the more stable it is. So the duplex breaks down into single strand. You know, what happens is Watson fixed structures, they break down. But now, if you have a triplex, and on one side you have a Watson fix like this, other side you have got a hook steam. How does this work out? If you take a triplex and do the same experiment, you know, heat it as a function of temperature, I mean, as a, and follow it as a uh, uh, absorbance, what you first see is you see first one melting here on the lower hand, you see one melting, then you also see a second melting. In the first case duplex, you saw only one melting, only one peak. Whereas here, you see two steps. This happens because, you know, the T and A, what is called the Hookstein hydrogen bonding that is weaker than the Watson quick. In the first step, the first strand, you know, goes away. It, uh, it, it, it is broken. Um, it goes, the, so you get two temperatures here and the Hookstein strand breaks, you get a duplex. So the green strand has come out. And then as you hit it further, the two duplexes break and you get three strands separately, you get T1 and T2. So this is what is important, you know, this is a technique. So the higher the TM, so for all our PNA, DNA, what we do is that we mix the two strands together and look at what is their, you know, stability. So a triplex, when it melts, you see two strands. When the duplex melts, you see only one signal. That's what you have to remember. So this is shown in the cartoon diagram again, a DNA triplex shows two signals, and this is the normal UV spectra as a function of temperature. If you take a derivative, you see a peak like this. It becomes very easy from the peak to determine what exactly is the TM here. You know, the peak, uh, the maxima tells you what is the TM. B says for a duplex and A curve says triplex. If you see two, that means there are two transitions. If you see three, there are three. If you see one, there is only one transition. You know, that is the indication. So what we are now interested in is that if you take a peptide nucleic acid and make it duplex, then it also shows one transition like this, PNA to DNA triplex, and this is the derivative. Now, in the case of PNA DNA triplex, unlike DNA, both the strands, they come out in a single step. So you will see one transition. So you can study PNA DNA duplex, PNA DNA triplex by simply recording UV as a function of temperature. That's all you have to remember. So let us see now, you know, what, what did we get? So we have made this as a peptide nucleic acid, which is called as a bimodal PNA or PNA, which, you know, surgery done. As you know, we have attached the bases on one side with triazole ring, on the other side, there is a tertiary amide. So that chemically they're different. You take a bimodal PNA like that. And then what you do is, you add a complementary strand, DNA on the left-hand side. You have AT, CAC, and this is complementary DNA you add. It binds from the tertiary amide side, you know, from this side, and you get a duplex. And once you get a duplex, or you add a complementary strand on that triazole phase. You know, I always say triazole phase to this triazole link basis, and tertiary amide to the other side, straight line. So if I add a complementary to CACG, it forms duplex. So this forms a duplex, and this also forms a duplex, and both the duplexes, as you know, are different. So if you do a UV temperature, you will see this A duplex, you know, with the DNA, it melts, temperature is 30.2 degrees centigrade. And on the right-hand side, the triazole duplex, it seems to be much, much higher, stronger, it melts at 47.7 degrees centigrade. So you can distinguish duplex formation from one side and the duplex formation from the other side. Now, what happens? You add both the DNAs together. Then this PNA is binding to one duplex from this, uh, one DNA from this side and the another DNA. And this forms, it is not a triplex. I call it as a double duplex. This is one duplex, this another duplex. Both of them, they share a common backbone. So when we did the TM, we were expecting that I will see two TMs, one for this duplex and for another for duplex. But in this case, we saw only one TM which means both of them are coming off together or they have identical TM. We got a single transition, but the temperature 56.6 was higher. It was more stable than either of these two duplexes, 30.2, 48.7, now it is 56.6. So then we wanted to try something new. Now here, it is a termolecular reaction. You take one strand, add two more molecules, three molecules are involved, a termolecular reaction. Can we convert it to a bimolecular reaction? That can be done by linking 
the two DNAs together through a hairpin. So we took this strand, put a TTT and made into one single DNA hairpin. You take this hairpin and then add this bimodal PNA. Now this is only a bimolecular reaction. When we did this, we found that we got two peaks here. You know, surprisingly, we got one for the melting of this left-hand helix, other one for the melting of the right-hand one, 65.4. You see that both of them are higher than their original TM. You know, 30.2, now it is giving 34.6 and B, it is giving 65.4. So what this bimodal PNA is doing is that it stabilizes both the duplexes. You know, that is very, very important. You know, it, so whatever the confirmation it adopts, they're compatible. Formation of one duplex helps entropically and enthalpically binding of the other two, you know, strand and both of them. This was, you know, is the first case where we have no such equivalent molecules in DNA. So we have a molecule which has two phases because of spine changing. And these two phases can bind to two DNA and they have different duplexes. Then how do we know that only one strand is binding? So one can do the stoichiometry by this plot, what's called the job plot. And from this thing, we conclude that one strand of this is binding to one strand, not to the two strand. Now this one has got all the T's here, T, 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 T. Remember, I told you that for formation of a triplex, you require a polyadenine strand. So if I take this bimodal PNA, and add DA8, this adenine can bind to two bimodal PNA like this. So it is forming a triplex. But this triplex has again other sequences present. So this triplex is melting at 30.3. You know, systematically we are analyzing. Now, if you add DG, which can bind to the C on this side and C on that side, that forms duplex. So now we have three, you know, one triplex and two duplexes, you know, arranged. It's such a very nice, simple manner. You know, it's a highly organized self-assembly or a molecular assembly. You just take these molecules, you design the sequence, you put them into the tube and immediately it forms. So how do you know? How do you know that? There's some disturbance, please. So the triplex is melting at 45.8 and the other one is melting at 73.5. So we can actually decompose, you know, these duplexes. So I've been going a little bit slow. Now I will slightly accelerate. You know, I hope you're all convinced that by making this bimodal PNA, you can start assembling as a template, high, you know, kind of molecular assembly. We also found that you can do a similar kind of thing, not on the trisole, but even on the amide sequence. So again, you have duplex one from one side, duplex on the other side. And when you put both of them, it very nicely forms two duplexes and now you are seeing two transitions here, 52.7, 73.9, and both of them are more stable. So we are now deriving a generality of you know, molecular assembly. When you take the S duplex, this is one, you do the R duplex, then also you get it, but the TMs are much lower. It says that the S configuration is more stable than the R configuration. So I'm using all the basic organic chemistry principles to understand these molecular assembly. I will probably skip this slide and then go to the uh, next part of my talk where now what happens if you want to assemble this, you can do two ways. You can take bimodal PNA and first add G sequence to form this duplex and then add A so that you can get the triplex. So, and, or you can do the reverse. So you can first add DA8, you first form a triplex and then you add DG, you, then you form the so-called triplex of duplexes. You can do the reverse. First, you add uh, the G and make the duplex and then add A8 and then form the triplex. So do you get, by changing the order, the same kind of triplex? So these things can be investigated by circular dichroism. So we did one pathway and recorded the circular dichroism. And we also did the other experiment and recorded the circular dichroism. And then what happens is that the final molecule, you know, if you superimpose, the product from this path and the product from this path, they exactly got superimposed. So you get the same assembly. What it means is that this is a programmed assembly. You can make any kind of sequences you design, just put them in one tube, you get the final assembly. So that is another important you know, uh, contribution to this area. Order of assembly does not matter. Now, I also told you that they can form C tetraplexes. Now, to investigate these C tetraplexes, you can again do the UVTM results. 
And I will not go into the detail just to say that now you see a negative curve biophysically at 295 nanometers, you see a negative transition in this gives what is the stability of the tetraplexia 68.3. And for different molecules, we showed that if you have poly C, they all form tetraplexes. You know, this is for our double phase PNA, it forms a tetraplex at 41.6. So we, we have other checks and balances. Now, the good thing is that if you make a tetraplex of this bimodal PNA, each of these strand has another sequence available to that. You know, you can see that on the, uh, on the here, on the right-hand side, D of PNA C5, you can frame tetraplex from here and then you get. So now if you add complementary strand, you initially it forms a tetraplex and the tetraplex forms four duplexes, you know, tetraduplex of a tetraplex. You know, these are extremely strong, you know, I don't think it is possible to organize that kind of complexes by any other way. You know, so we are actually getting into a new area of multi-stranded, you know, complexes. We are done several kinds of checks thing. I will skip all this and go to illustrate. And another interesting thing, what we have done is, can we change? So this all tells about the stability, you know, tetraplexes are more stable than the duplexes. It shows, I will show another one kind of thing. Now, if you have cytidines, it is very well known that the cytidines, if you put silver, two cytidines can bind to each other and it forms a silver complex. Now here you don't require protonation. At physiological pH, you can generate a CC duplex. It cannot form a triplex. And also you see that if you take only AEG PNA and that melting itself is 48.8, but the moment you put silver, it stabilizes. The moment it forms duplex, it gets stabilized to 71.0. So we thought that we could use silver on our bimodal PNA. So we can prepare a PNA molecule in which the cytidines are all on the tertiary amide side. So this should form one silver duplex, you know, like this. Or we can also make a PNA molecule in which cytidines are on the other side, triazole side. Now you will get a different kind of, you know, C, A, G, C, you know, duplex. So these are entirely topologically different structures. Silver complex from tertiary amide side, silver complex from this one. So again, we could follow these kinds of things by doing this UVTM melting. So what you find is that I take the cytidine, put a DNA, you know, this forms a DNA, PNA, DNA duplex hybrid, and you take only the bimodal PNA and add silver, I get a PNA, PNA silver duplex. And you see that this also melts beautifully at 68.3, which is higher than the normal complex. And then you add this DNA, now I'm getting a complex in which one, you know, earlier we had a triplex. Now I have a silver duplex. So this is a triple duplex. So I showed you double duplex. I showed you triplex of duplexes. Now this is one duplex, silver duplex. So in this complex, the duplexation is happening by two different mechanisms, hydrogen bonding and silver complex. And you can see the corresponding transitions here. So this is where silver complex is formed from the so-called triazole side. Now, you can do the other way around. Can we make similar kind of thing from the tertiary amide side? This is what we did. Again, we made those molecules. We put all the cytidines in the tertiary amide side and a mixed hybrid. So we can generate a similar kind of complex where now the silver complex is from the tertiary amide side. And again, you see the duplex formation. So the generality, you know, all these things is how this assembly happens. The generality with the controls, stability, etc. we have been able to do that. Now, we also did another one, last example I'm going to give you is this, a branched PNA. So we made a chiral PNA, you know, you have a pyrrolidine, we attach three branches with cytidine. So when you put silver, they should form three armed silver complex, you know, they form silver complex, duplex, silver duplex, silver duplex here, you know, three of them. Now, what we found was that when you leave this duplex for about one hour or so, we got beautiful self-assembly. We got a nano picture like this, almost like a star. And these things started assembling with each other and to form a silver assisted, you know, assembly. So now how do you know some assembly is formed? I have given you uh, stability results. The other way is to look at their scanning electron microscopy pictures because when molecules assemble, they give these beautiful, you know, patterns. You know, they give that. So in this case, we have shown, you know, we could relate this kind of nanostructure, nanostar to this kind of assembly. So in summary, what I would like to say is that, you know, I've not gone into the details, 
we have very very creatively you know all the 20 years people were in peptide nucleic acid this is the upgraded peptide nucleic acid version 2 we have modified and so that this can form hydrogen bonding from both sides so this bimodal pna what we call it can form double duplexes you know using the watson pick hydrogen bonding or it can also through the uh, this example i have not shown although we have done that it can form a dna duplex also with uh, cytidine then it can form the so called triplex it can form triplex of duplexes it can form and then you can also form silver complexes duplexes and it can form a triple duplex in which one of them is a uh, duplex by silver the other is by watson pick hydrogen bonding so this has opened up entirely a new area in the term of molecular assembly there are so many unlimited variations we can do that and this has all been published in the last you know in the during the covid time actually 2020 2021 what i have presented is most of is published the most the recent silver one is chemcom uh, it is there and then where do we go from that we are now trying to assemble make a tetraplex and then you see whether you can organize duplexes around that you know you'll get a very very complex structure like this a tetraplex the duplex what is the advantage is that for example if you have a guanine tetraplex you make with bimodal pna you can start linking different tetraplexes like this you can make a series of tetraplexes you know and these things will be very very useful for inhibition of genes particularly telomerases you know, which all operate through g tetraplex structures so these are even higher ordered you know structures so this is how some colorful you know things look like and we can also design this kind of you know i also showed you a silver complex with the trimer we can make this what is called the origami you know dna origami you can do that we are also using that in uh, taking plasmid dna and these double phase pnas can become like lego blocks so these are really new very very versatile molecules which can give we also have an idea of using it in biological application where we can replace an entire enzyme complex through a you know so called bimodal pna it can bind the genus pna or the two phase pna and you can replace the entire complex uh, this is a tall order but nevertheless we are trying to get because if this works out this could be a very very good uh, you know transcription inhibitor and as i said this can also form nice pharmacological uh, you know topological structures you know different assemblies they give different kinds of nanoparticles you see this silver complex gives in almost disk in which there is a hollow sphere here and some of them give very needles when you have dna ones so many of these things particularly silver complexes also can be used to what is called as a molecular y you know silver is a conducting one if you have a series of silver ions neatly arranged they can become molecular wise supra molecular organization there are several potential applications in fact i have you know reached the fag end of my career but i am getting this exciting results and i wish i can continue in my you know research uh, it can actually go for another 5 years the number of possibilities you know that exist so finally what i would like to say is that we have been able to you know have called a spinal surgery by doing spinal surgery we have actually introduced two phases for the peptide nucleosid as you know this is a medical impossibility you can never put two phases with a spinal injury but it is a chemical possibility by changing the spine of pna you can actually derive two phases and these things the phases are recognition values they can start recognizing they can start organizing the assemblies and uh, you know almost in an unlimited manner for both material applications and biological applications you can use them so finally i have to thank my students uh, you know particularly who have done that um, you know i have shown al drubi is at alnilam pharmaceuticals now uh, he has been associated with me in the right the beginning uh, as a postdoc and uh, pramod and manoj did most of the bimodal pna work which is now being continued with irana and uh, uh, madan also contributed quite a lot to the biophysical studies now our higher order thing some of them are being done by my group at you know i said tirupati so i have to thank all of them as you see they are very very tedious chemical reactions not only you have to learn chemistry you have to learn biophysics you have to learn microscopy and also you have to do biological experiments finally so it's really an interdisciplinary area and i hope uh, the audience got a glimpse of how by using the knowledge of basic organic chemistry you can reach higher structures you know assembly which are useful both in material science and biological applications with this thing i thank you very much and i hope i have i might have exceeded by 10 minutes i 
uh, you know, ask you an excuse for that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was really uh, fantastic uh, lectures and uh, we're listening very carefully. Uh, you explained all this uh, drug discovery process. Uh, it's already a very complex process and uh, uh, you're behaving like a perfect surgeon. So you're doing those uh, transplantations, putting, uh, picking the molecules, a small, uh, small, small part of the molecules and putting it uh, at the place where uh, you want uh, to put it and then uh, making the molecules to work as you want to uh, work uh, work that molecule and uh, the act uh, the activity you are looking uh, you are expecting from that molecule. So uh, this was really uh, I know it's a very very complex uh, uh, work, uh, but uh, you explained it in a very very simple way, and uh, uh, I'm sure because a lot of stereochemistry was involved uh, means uh, very small changes. Uh, the the complex uh, reactions uh, you have explained uh, that was definitely inspire uh, the young faculty those who are listening to you and uh, uh, the young phd students so i i hope uh, it, this work will definitely inspire and uh, they will be uh, aspiring to uh, work uh, in this particular field so thank you very much sir uh, i know you were busy and uh, you very kindly agreed uh, for uh, your talk uh, 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 to uh, uh, it uh, in, in uh, for this our foundation day celebrations, uh, uh, it could uh, this time it it happened virtually, but definitely we are looking forward uh, for your guidance because your inspirations uh, for many of us uh, we wish uh, to be like you, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to see you here uh, in this university in this campus and uh, for your uh, guidance. Uh, I uh, now request uh, Professor uh, Rajesh for a formal vote of thanks. A very good morning to all. On this occasion, it's my pleasure to propose vote of thanks and sincere gratitude to respected honorable speaker, Professor K. N. Ganesh for sparing his time from busy schedule and to deliver a lecture related to specifically for synthetic important aspects of synthetic chemical biology and biophysical chemistry. So, sir, we are very thanks to you. I would like to thanks and my sincere gratitude to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajendra Prasad Tiwari ji for his kind help, support and motivation to conduct this event very successfully. I would like to thanks our registrar, sir, our HOD, Dr. Vinod Kumar ji, Deans, the HOD of different departments, faculty members, officers, students, and staff for their presence and for kind cooperation. Thank you all. Uh, I, I request you all for uh, uh, to raise for the uh, national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Uttkala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladhita Ranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I can leave now. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.